couldn't handle Get ready for a battle Cause you know Well, we are going to open up our last portion of the series, The Good Work. Now, again, if this is your first time here, we're happy that you're here. Uh, come and say hi to me at the uh, guest services at the end of service. Uh, but I, I just want you to know, this is a great time to step in to this final message of The Good Work. Um, this is a series uh, where we are encouraging you uh, to make much of your life in Jesus Christ. Uh, this, is, this is a series where we want to see you not just start something, but finish well. And today we're going to talk about how to grow for a lifetime in Christ. So whether this is your first time in church, first time in a long time, or you come each and every week, we want you to know that you're not here on this planet by accident. You're here because Jesus Christ knew you from eternity past. You were created, woven together in your mother's womb, Scripture says. You have purpose and God has plans. Let's make them merge together because I want you to know you are made for God. You are made for God to move in and through you. Now, the book of Nehemiah is a, it's an interesting book. It is a historical book. Uh, it is it's a time where God's people are being called back into Israel after a 70-year-plus exile. The people uh, promised to follow God. They didn't. God allowed Israel to be divided into, sent into exile. Uh, and by the time that we see Nehemiah, the Persian Empire had arisen and allowed God's people to go back into Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, uh, repair the wall, repair the doors, which was important for security, and the people of God began to repopulate the city of God. This is really, really important because in biblical history, there were prophets that said a Messiah is going to come out of Israel, uh, and, and a Messiah that is going to come to save uh, the sins of the world. And so if Israel doesn't exist, how is a, a prophecy like that uh, to be fulfilled? Well, Israel came back. Uh, a Messiah came out of Israel, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, came to die for your sins and my sins, resurrected from the dead, and now we are awaiting Christ to come back. And now we're given even further prophecies that God's going to use Israel uh, in the future, and we begin to see history even unfold, prophecy even befold, uh, come, uh, come before our very eyes. Now, my question to you is this. Do you know God personally? I'm not talking about knowing things about God, but would you say this morning, do you know God personally? Is Christ your personal savior? Have you placed your faith and trust in him alone? Is Christ your Lord? That means is, is Christ your leader of your life, all of your life? Today the word of God is gonna encourage you to answer those questions uh, and to answer them boldly. Not just kind of like, ah, to answer them confidently. And also, uh, we're going to see from Scripture today how you can keep growing in your relationship with God. We were created to know God personally. But our sins have separated us from God. Sin is missing the mark of God's holiness. Sin is, is a word that is an archery term. Whenever you would... Uh, whenever you would uh, Send the bow and arrow to the target, and you would miss. Actually, the arrow you don't want to throw the the bow at the target. But when you're when when you when you uh, when you hit the, when you you take up your bow and arrow, and the and the arrow misses the bullseye, uh, that is called a sin. You you miss the mark. You miss the bullseye. Well, sin in a theological understanding means that we missed the bullseye of God's holiness. Every single one of us has missed the bullseye. Every single one of us has sinned. Every single one of us has done wrong, right? Am I informed? Is this news to somebody? Did somebody come in today thinking they were perfect, right? I'm just perfect. You're in the wrong place, right? Because nobody's perfect in here. And when we realize that nobody's perfect, that we've missed it, Scripture says because we've missed it, the wages of those sins is death, spiritual death. Uh, most people, what they do in response is they want to at least give themselves some assurances that they're okay with God. So they get involved with religion. Kenosha has been a very religious city. 
Uh, Kenosha is a place where, where people think they're good with the man upstairs and maybe they have a relationship with him. Maybe they don't. They hope that when they die that things will be okay. And I want to tell you, a lot of people when they get to the funeral, they're hoping that things will be good. Why is it that when you go to a funeral and people say it's better now, that for many of us, uh, we're like, well, is it better now for that person or is it going to be better now for me? I want you to know that scripture allows us to be confident that not only can you have a relationship with Jesus right now, but you can be confident in where you're going when you die. Because every single one of us is going to die. The wages of sin is death. But what people try to do in order to give themselves confidence is they try to do good works. They try to do good things. They become religious. Even though scripture says very clearly that our religious works are nothing but to God but dirty rags. We cannot save ourselves. The wages of sin is death, physical death, and spiritual death. It's why when we come to funerals, and even though if somebody's 105 years old and they lived a good, awesome life, we still have that feeling that it shouldn't have been this way. Why do we have to lose people to death? Well, it wasn't supposed to be that way. God created us to know him. God created us to have a relationship with him when we went our own way. And the wages, that means the result of sin, was physical death and spiritual death. But God intervened. While we wanted nothing to do with God, while I wanted nothing to do with God, while you all wanted nothing to do with God, you know what God did? He came 2,000 years ago that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He died for us. He intervened to stand in our place, fully God, fully man, to stand in our place to take the wrath of God, that the sins that we should be punished for, Christ was punished. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. You're not saved by works, you are saved by grace. What is grace? It's not just some old grandma's name or some trendy newborn baby's name. No, grace means this, undeserved favor. It means that God gave us favor that we didn't deserve. And it's our responsibility if we want to receive the forgiveness of our sins that we need to receive this forgiveness by placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You see, you getting right with God isn't about you being perfect or you doing good things. In fact, one of our slogans here, one of our core values that we live by here at Kenosha City Church is that we're not perfect people, but we are people made new in Jesus. When you place your faith and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you have what is called then a Christian testimony. We're gonna hear some of those today as people are going public in their faith today through baptism. But when you place your faith and trust in Jesus, you have what is called a personal testimony. A testimony, a a testimony defined in the dictionary, is a solemn declaration, a firsthand authentication of evidence. So as a Christian, it is a declaration of a person's decision they are a Jesus follower. I love how the Christian organization Crew, it's a, it's a Christian college organization, uh, Crew puts it this way. Your testimony, regardless of how ordinary or spectacular you think it is, is a story about God's character. It is your eyewitness account of how God rescued you from sin and death through Christ and changed your life as a result. When you share your story of how you were saved with others, You help them get to know what God is like and what he can do. God came to rescue us from the deep predicament of our sin. Without God, there is no other hope. And God sent Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, to be our hope. And when you place your faith and trust in Christ... You aren't to stay as you are because Christ transforms you. He changes you. Uh, That's what a testimony is so beautiful. You were once this way. God brought you to a moment of decision, and now your life is changed. Not perfect, but it's changed. Why? Because the Spirit of God comes to live in you. And what the Spirit of God does is he enables you for God to move in you, change in you things that you would be incapable of doing by yourself. You are called to grow. And an epidemic today is that many Christians think that they can receive Jesus and then just stay the way that they are. But that is not God's plan for you. In fact, we see in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, God's plan for this is God's will. Your sanctification. 
This is God's will for your life. You're like, I want to know what God's will is for my life. Man, oh, what, what kind of, what, what, who am I going to marry? Or, or what kind of house am I going to buy? What, what job do I, listen, those are things to pray about, right? But you want to know what God's will for your life is, your sanctification. You're like, sanctify what? Sanctification. Sanctification is a theological term, means a constant, systematic growing in Christ. It's your life conforming to Christ. You're conforming to something. You might be conforming to culture. You might be conforming to your friends group you might be conforming to different podcasts that you're listening to and Christ is saying listen here's the deal your the will of God for your life is to be conformed to Christ and this is a big problem for many is that they're not conforming to Christ so let's put this in graph form what should a life of a Christian look like here it is here's a for those you're like oh yes a graph yay here it is right and so let's say before Christ, and listen, we have people in here each and every week that are, are, not, are not saved. Uh, they're here maybe searching uh, things, or maybe they, they have questions, or, or maybe somebody forced them to be here. You're not getting a free lunch unless you go to church, right? All the above. We love it that people are here figuring things out about God. We love that. There is no judgment in that. Uh, you, you shouldn't, people are like, well, I'm not gonna look like a Christian. You shouldn't look like a Christian, right? Because you're not one, right? But we're happy that you're considering being one. Well, here's the deal. Non-Christian, right? Uh, that means that it's a slaves to sin. That means that uh, we, are, we are a servant to sin, right? What happens is this. When you say yes to Jesus, point number one, whoop, you see there's a big rise, right? <laughs> and becoming more like Jesus. But look at the Christian life. The Christian life, it's like the stock market. It goes up and down. When someone says, I place my faith and trust in Jesus, and boom, all my problems went away. They are a liar, all right? I mean, I haven't met a single person, right? It's the ups and downs of life. We make mistakes, right? Uh, we say the wrong thing, right? Uh, we, we, have, we, have our, we, we have doubts or we have fears or we have anxieties. The ups and downs of the Christian life can look like the stock market. However, I want you to know this. God desires your sanctification means that through all the ups and downs, it's still an upward trajectory. Does that make sense? That you're becoming more and more like Christ. When do you arrive? When Jesus Christ comes back or you die and go before him. You can never stop growing in Jesus Christ. But the big problem is this. People don't want to be sanctified they want to get out a hell free card. All right, I'll say yes to Jesus, uh, but I want to live my life the way it is. That is not the will of God for your life. You are robbing yourself of the greatness of what God wants to do in and through you when you have that mindset. And I want you to know that no matter who you are today, even if you're on the mountaintop with God, like, man, God and I, we're doing so good right now. I want you to be warned. Every single one of us is inclined to drift away from God, to drift away from the things of God, to do it, our own way. Remember last week, if you were here, I said the theme of hell is Frank Sinatra's song, I did it my way, right? That's gonna be on loop, right? <laughs> All right? So if you like Frank Sinatra, it's the only thing you're gonna, I'm, I'm kidding, I don't think that's gonna be playing in hell. But you get what I'm saying? We wanna do it our own way. And we're inclined to drift. Some people drift because they stop hanging with good influences in their life. Some people drift because maybe you've become addicted to something. I want you to know if you're here today and you're addicted to something, you're in the right place because God breaks addictions. I want you to know this, that some of you, you're drifting today because your life's busyness has just pushed you out of the things of God. Maybe you dated someone who didn't value the Lord. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. Maybe it was life's hardships or maybe just quite simply, you've been drifting because you have not been reading the Bible, you haven't been praying, uh, you haven't been pursuing God, and life is making you drift away from him. I want you to know that God's will is for your sanctification. God's will is that you grow. And yet we see through the pages of the Bible, example after example, whether it was uh, the people who walked with Jesus called the disciples, right? They were walking so well with him then all of a sudden Jesus gets betrayed by one of the disciples and the rest of the disciples are like, uh, we don't know him, right? Like how did they get to that point, right? The disciples betrayed, uh, they uh, denied Christ, they, they did come back. Or was it the names at the end of Paul's letter in the New Testament? I, I, I could think of Paul usually writes letters and we see these letters in the Bible. They're usually to early churches and it's for our instruction. 
Uh, and he'll usually say hello to people at the beginning and end of the letters. There's one guy in particular, I remember he was saying hello to, he was doing such great work, his name was Demas, but by the time you get to the end of the New Testament, Demas had departed. Why is it that people drift? Because we are prone to wander. We are prone to drift, and we have to be intentional if we're going to grow in Christ. And we see it in the nation of Israel in, our, in the book of Nehemiah. See, Israel, they were created as a unique group of people uh, to be a people that were to share the reality of God to an unbelieving world, and yet instead of sharing God, they became more like the world than more like the character of God. And so they were sent into exile, and Nehemiah now has the God-given task of bringing the rest of Israel back into the promised land. You see, here's the deal. When we wander from the truth of God, you're going to wander from growth. You're going to wander from becoming more and more like Christ. And so here's what's so key. If you want to grow in God this morning, number one, you've got to place your faith and trust in him. If you don't know him, that's your first step. Your first step is to say, Lord Jesus, I need forgiveness. Lord Jesus, I want to make my relationship with you personal. Lord Jesus, step into my life. That's, that's step number one. But step number two is this, is you need to lean into his truth. Because, and this is the main idea this morning, God's truth reforms. God's truth reforms. If we try to do things in our own understanding, I want you to know you're going to drift. We need God's understanding, and we know God's understanding through Scripture. God's truth reforms. When you think of the word reform, it means to make simple changes or complex changes. We see Nehemiah in this morning, in Nehemiah chapter 13, where we'll be at. Nehemiah is going to make a number of reforms so that people continue to become more like God. They won't become God, but we are told to become more like him in character. So we're going to see this morning that reformation in our lives that causes growth comes by the word of God. It reforms how we relate to one another and it also relates to what we worship and how we worship. So let's take a look at number one. The reformation by the word. If we are going to grow in the Lord, we need to be reformed by his word. God gave us his word uh, so that we can know him. God has protected his word uh, and he has upheld his word so that we can know his will. And so reading the Bible is the sure fastest way of getting right and understanding what God wants for your life. And so we see here the nation of Israel has brought, been brought back and they begin to read the word of God. They begin to be reformed by the word of God. Nehemiah chapter 13 verse 1. At the time the book of Moses was read publicly to the people. The command was found written that no Ammonite and Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God because they did not meet the Israelites with food and water. Instead, they hired Balaam against them to curse them. But our God turned the curse into a blessing. And when they heard the law, they separated all those of mixed descent from Israel. So what we see here is to grow, you must reform into God's truth. And so the first thing Israel did was they opened up the word of God and they began to read it, and they began to say, okay, how, when we apply this to our life, where is there a disconnect by how we're living and what God says how we should live? The restoration of God's city, the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the walls, repopulating of, of Jerusalem, that was a big, huge win. But what God's main goal wasn't the restoration of a physical building or buildings. His main goal was the restoration of the people's hearts. And you need to understand that. Even in missions right now, people get really excited about digging wells or building buildings. By the way, those are good things. In 2025, we hope to be building homes for, uh, for some of our orphanage families. How cool is that, right? But I want to tell you what God is really want to make sure that we don't miss is the restoration of our hearts. Making sure our hearts are right with God and growing in Christ. So the word of God was read publicly to the people of Israel. And again, by the time they approached the book of Deuteronomy... All right, the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, specifically Deuteronomy 23, they were reminded that no person of the Ammonites or Moabites should enter the gatherings of the people of Israel because they were long enemies and opposed the things of God. Now, it's not because of ethnicity or certain people groups are better than the others. It's this group was by vow committed to being against the things of God. And what Israel had done over time is they would often uh, mix ideas and ideologies and families and it would send Israel away from God. They begin to drift. So it was important for the nation of Israel to be a witness to the world without being influenced in the world. Uh, today as a church, uh, we face some of the same 
a predicament. We are in the world. We're not to hide from the world. We're to engage and influence the world, right? We're to love the people in the world, but we're not to love the ways of the world. Does that make sense? Oh, man, sometimes we can get this mixed up. We're like, I just want to, you know, I just want to relate to people. I want to be relevant. And what people end up doing is they begin compromising biblical truth in the name of Jesus. It's so, so dangerous. Many churches fall into this trap. And if we're not careful, if we're not Bible Christians here, right, and spirit-empowered Christians, uh, we will fall into this trap as well. And so... We are to love people in the world by sharing what it is by being, being like Christ. We are to be influencers. We're going to invite people. You're Christ's ambassadors. But today I want to say many Christians or people who say they're Christians are at a crossroads when it comes to biblical truth. Many Christians and even churches are looking to align secular and even unbibliical ideals with their Christianity. A Christ follower feels the pressure to embrace and somehow merge these secular ideologies or vocabulary uh, into the church. And so the crossroads is this. When you read scripture, are you going to allow it to transform your life or are you going to try to transform scripture? Many people are doing the latter. They're trying to transform scripture to fit into their life so they don't have to change. Uh, That makes scripture meaningless, worthless, right? But the scripture is of such value because it is God's inerrant word. It's God's authoritative word. It's his will for our life. And so when we're reading scripture, it's so, so important that it informs us how to live. A decade ago, the Reverend Dr. Isaac Catrois of Asbury University warned the, uh, warned the Christian seminary of future pastors of an impending breakdown of truth. Here is his quote in part. He said, postmodernism seeks to dismantle Christianity, or anything else really for that matter, but dismantle Christianity by overturning traditional standards and binary oppositions. While postmodern proposes harmony and community, it is done at the expense of deconstructing established text, structures, arts, and systems. What a prophetic word. This was 10 years ago where a number of these words were maybe only in the academic. But today we are seeing people literally try to burn systems, try to burn ideals, try to burn biblical theology to the ground so they can reconstruct something that's not biblical, but it fits in with the culture. Uh, We we can't do that. Uh, We must understand that God's word is unchanging, that God's word is informing how we are to live for Christ. At Kenosha City Church, one of our core values is that we take God At his word. You can see our core values in the lobby. Uh, We take God at his word. Uh, This is what drives our mission. Uh, The word of God drives our behavior. Uh, The word of God drives our conviction. The word of God drives our hope. It drives our understanding of the necessity of the gospel. Which means we are not alone led by tradition. We are not alone led by denomination. And by the way, one thing I love about Kenosha City Church, we are a melting pot of people having previous denomination backgrounds, right? But what binds us together uh, is the Lord Jesus Christ. What binds us together is the conviction of the gospel. What binds us together is that we can't do it in our flesh. We must have the Holy Spirit. And what I love about it is if, if, if we're about the gospel, game on, right? But we're not led by just tradition or denomination. or We're not led by somebody's whimsical prophetic word or, or even our personality. These things aren't bad, by the way. But these things must be subservient to the, to the word of God. These things must be subservient to the word of God. When these things become greater than the word of God, we will run into error 100% of the time. By the way, when a church says they believe in the Bible, you need to ask further questions. Today, people are getting cute, right? Oh, yes, we believe in the Bible. They have a robust theology. I love it when people ask us further questions about our theology. You're trying to clarify what do we believe. We don't want to hide what we believe. We need to be really clear what we believe, right? But people are trying not to be clear today so they can hide that they don't believe actually what they think you believe. Does that make sense? There are pastors, and pastors I know of today, that that would say something that sounds so biblical uh, behind the pulpit, but they would say, shh. I don't believe the Bible is inerrant. I believe the Bible's full of errors. Oh, maybe Jesus sinned. That's not what the Bible says, but yet they're trying to mix their life in with culture instead of uh, engaging culture with the biblical truth of scripture. So you need to ask further questions. When someone says they believe in the Bible, uh, you need to ask them, well, do you believe it's without error? Just ask them point blank. Do you believe the Bible's without error? 
Their answer will be very telling. Uh, do you believe that anything changes in Scripture? Do you believe that, that, that some cultural ideas supersede anywhere in Scripture? Ask them point blank examples. What do you think the Bible teaches about sexuality? What do you think the Bible teaches about life? What do you think the Bible teaches about heaven and hell? Ask these questions. We take God at his word. It is perfect. It is without error. It is indeed unchanging. The word of God reforms our behavior. The Bible is in no need of reformation. To be transformed to the ways of Christ, we must understand the word of God. And the people of Israel, they read the word of God, and we will see they were already drifting. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you've noticed that Israel came back. Uh, they, they celebrated uh, the rebuilding of the temple. They celebrated in a worship service. They've heard the word of God already. They began changing their life. But already as we get to chapter 13, they're drifting. They're drifting. Well, it's because they were disconnecting from God's word because God's truth reforms and if we're reformed by his word, it will reform them how we relate to one another. That's number two, the reformation of our, of our relationships. If you're reformed by the word of God, there's going to be a reformation of your relationships, namely how you relate to one another. When we allow God to be the leader that is the Lord of our lives, this puts on notice how we are to relate to one another. We are not to relate to one another as the world relates to one another. We are not to relate to one another in, in malice and strife and bitterness. We are to relate to one another in truth uh, and, and relate to one another in grace. Again, also how we relate to one another, uh, that is how we're loyal to maybe certain people, or it, again, how we relate to people must be subservient to the word of God. Too often people are not who they are in Christ because they fear people instead of God. I want you to know this right now, our relationships, whether they're family, whether they're best friends, whether they're people you talk around the water cooler at work, whoever it is, I want you to know these relationships and how you relate to them and what comes out of your mouth needs to be subservient to the word of God. We are tempted to allow our friends, family, uh, our cliques control how we follow God, and I want you to know it needs to be God who controls these things. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 4, we see how this began to drift even in the relationships with the people of Israel. Now before this, uh, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 4, now before this, the priest, Eliashib, Eliashib, had been put in charge of storerooms of the house of our God. And he was a relative of Tobiah. And he had prepared a large room for him where they had previously stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tents of grain, the new wine, the fresh oil pre prescribed for the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, along with the contributions for the priests. Time out here. By the way, if they did a giving talk like Brandon did uh, in, the, in these days, uh, they wouldn't say, hey, here's the four ways you can give, right? They'd be like, all right, uh, the bushel for your, for your produce go right there. Uh, your first, uh, the, the lambs can go over there. Like it, the way that they, what was, what was valuable back then was their first fruits. It was what they were farming. It was, that was what they traded with. And so we see here, uh, that that's what this room was for, was for the contributions. Verse six, while all this was happening, I was not in Jerusalem because I had returned to King Artaxerxes of Babylon in the 32nd year of his reign. It was only later that I asked the king for a leave of absence so I could return to Jerusalem. Then I discovered the evil uh, that Elishib had done on behalf of Tobiah by providing him a room in the courts of God's house. So we are told by this scripture that after all the reforms, after all the worship services, Nehemiah is like, sweet, I need to do some business back in Persia. It's Persia who allowed us to do this. Technically, Persia uh, is, is still in control of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah knew that he needed to make sure that things were right uh, in the Persian capital, right? Uh, if this thing's gonna continue. So he took some time, some years, to go spend in Persia and, and spend time away from Jerusalem. And you know the old saying, when the cat's away, the mice come out and play, right? Right? That's exactly what happened here. When Nehemiah was gone, we see, uh, we, we see that bad things happen. Verse four. Now before this, the priest, Elishabib, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God, and he was a relative of Tobiah. Tobiah. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, the red flag should be going up. 
The bell should be ringing. Tobiah. It's been a few weeks since we've talked about Tobiah. Who is Tobiah? Oh, Tobiah is notorious. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 19. When Samballot, Tobiah, and Geshem heard about this, when they were hearing about the plans of refurbishing Jerusalem, okay, this is the very beginning of Nehemiah, they mocked and despised us and says, what is this you're doing? You're rebelling against the king. Oh, yeah, Tobiah is the OG baddie, right? He's the OG gangster against the things of God, right? Tobiah is showing up in the temple? I guess when the cat's away, the mouse really did come out and play, right? Tobiah had actively opposed the rebuilding of the wall. Tobiah had falsely accused Nehemiah, slandered Nehemiah, sent false prophets to give false prophecies against Nehemiah, and intimidated and tried to intimidate Nehemiah. He didn't intimidate him because Nehemiah kept working, right? He was doing all that stuff. Tobiah was bad, right? And so the big tell here was that Tobiah was not only living in the temple, but he was related to some within the people of God. And he acted as a dangerous bridge of influence into the people of God. We're told in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 17. During those days, the nobles of Judah, that means the the nobles of Judah, those those are big influential people in the people of God in Jerusalem. The nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him. These nobles kept mentioning Tobiah's good deeds to me, and they reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. I'm sure the nobles are like, oh, Nehemiah, would you just leave Tobiah alone? I know that he can get cranky sometimes, but he's no big deal, right? He's, he's, he's actually quite nice. We've been exchanging letters. I mean, yeah, he says bad things about you, but oh, we know who you are. We just, we want both of you, right? You know, here's the problem. And church, this is our problem too in life is no matter how negative of a person can be, we always want to say, oh, they don't affect me. But they do, right? They do. Whether it's gossip around the water cooler at work, slander talking with friends, or just someone who's negative in general that you're hanging out with, these attitudes spread and they spread into you. And as much as you think otherwise, you are not immune. Who you hang with is who you will, at least in part, eventually become. Now, I'm not saying your friends have to be perfect. I'm just saying if you allow unabated uh, these negative things to penetrate your life, they will affect you and they will make you, in part, like that person you hang with. It's like the old saying, you know, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Tobiah's influence spread, and while Nehemiah was gone, Tobiah weaseled his way to take up residence in the temple. And we know that the influence was spreading because the very room that he stayed in was supposed to be the room that the tithes and offerings to support the ministry of Israel was supposed to be in. It was empty. The people got off mission. Uh, When people get off mission, they stop giving, right? Uh, People are like, well, no, I stop giving because I get mad. No, well, no. (laughs) Uh, You say that to orphans, okay, right? Like, if you're off mission, right, if you're off mission, you will stop giving, all right, or you won't give the full tithe. All right? This is what was happening. Tobiah's influence just put a wet blanket on everything God was doing. And he's like, sweet. And guess what? When the tithe room was empty, he was like, he talked to Elisha Bib and he said, hey, do you think I can uh, have some free residence? And he's like, yeah, sure. Yeah, you can, you can sleep here. What we have here is the first biblical account of a temple squatter, right? You've heard about home squatting, right? Uh, we got a temple squatter right here. By the way, the quickest way to see where your heart is, is what do you value in your life? What, 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 what do your possessions do to you? Obviously, the people of Israel, they bought into some kind of lie, and they quit supporting the ministry, and now the enemies of God had moved in to the temple. We'll speak more about giving in just a moment. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 8. This was <laughs> Nehemiah's response. I was greatly displeased. So... Nehemiah comes back, and he was greatly displeased that somebody was living in the tithe room, and it was Tobiah. I was greatly uh, displeased, so I threw all of Tobiah's household possessions out of the room, 
and I ordered the rooms to be purified and had the articles of the house of God restored there along with the grain offering and the frankincense. Nehemiah went right to town. First of all, he's like, hey, I put, I put all your stuff on the curb, Tobiah, all right? You can't, you can't sleep there. And then he began to talk to the people of Israel saying, look, you're literally having your priests and your singers, they, they, they aren't supported. Uh, we see the ministry is not being supported. This room needs to be filled again if the function of the temple is to, is to not dilapidate again. So Nehemiah's reaction was twofold. It was anger and action. Nehemiah didn't stop and say, you know, man, I just, if I throw Tobiah out, what are people going to think? I mean, he's got a good reputation. And if I do this, people are going to think I'm just over the top. Maybe they'll even believe the slander. Like, maybe I should just kind of get a little, uh, do a little research here and see what people really think. He didn't do any of that. I remember years ago, I, I, faced, I faced a very uh, tough yet biblical decision. And somebody met me uh, and they said, hey, Andy, I just want you to know, if you make this decision, it's going to anger people that are very well known and have very powerful last names. I got goosebumps. Not because of the powerful last names, because I realized if I gave in to that, I'd be standing opposed to what God actually wanted. And I want you to know that was hard, okay? Uh, that, that brought some fear and trepidation. It was like, yep, I just did. No, it was like, ugh. Gut, you know, it, it made your gut sink, right? I'm sure that's what happened with Nehemiah, but Nehemiah understood this. He is not here to please to buy his friends, even if they're family. He must do what is right before God. He did what was right. The scripture says he purified the temple. That word purified can be translated cleansed. Nehemiah viewed this room was polluted from its intended use, and that pollutant was the influencing presence of Tobiah and the nation of Israel. So Nehemiah immediately evicted the temple squatter, returned to its room to its proper function. And I can't be, but be reminded in the New Testament, Jesus did something similar in this very temple. In the same temple, uh, in the temple courts, you had money changers that were selling things, and the courts were Gentiles that were people that didn't know about God were supposed to come in and ask questions. Uh, they couldn't do that any longer because it became this little uh, farmer's market of temple doves, right? And, and Jesus came walking through and he's like, man, these guys are a den of robbers. So Jesus tipped over the tables like, what are you doing, Jesus? Like, it's my temple, right? Jesus temp, uh, uh, tipped the, the tables over. Now, the description of Nehemiah throwing people out and Jesus tipping tables over, it is descriptive. It is not prescriptive uh, for you and I today. Don't go into places or if you see something you don't like, you can start trashing the place, all right? You'd be like, well, Jesus did that. I hear that all the time. Well, Jesus tipped over tables about high time I start tipping over tables. You're not Jesus, okay, right? That's descriptive, not prescriptive. I remember many years ago, uh, before this was Kenosha City Church, we started serving donuts and one person got really, really mad, all right? I don't even remember who, I didn't really know who this person was, but they got really, really mad, and they started telling, uh, I don't even know, they weren't even called the host team at the time, they were called the greeters team. They told our greeters team, hey, you know what? I should just tip all these donut tables over. In fact, I'm going to, right? And so, like, the greeters team started, like, huddling again, like, what do we do? This guy's gonna tip all our donut tables over, right? And then they kind of looked, and when, no, when he thought nobody was looking, he grabbed a donut and ate it, went to the parking lot. I thought it was great. Anyway. <laughs> Oh, the account of Jesus and Nehemiah is descriptive. Today, though, you want to know where the temple's at? You want to know where you can tip tables over? You want to know where you, where you can get a little rowdy? You want to know? Our body is called the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? If there's anywhere where you can tip tables over, it needs to be what is lodged in your heart, and that's not of God. You could tip the table over of the bitterness in your heart. You could tip the table over of the falsehood in your heart. You could tip the tables of over the, the, the voices in your head that are telling you that you're no good. You could tip the tables over of the addiction, of the lust, of the revenge. Just tip it over, right? You want to get rowdy? Get rowdy with your heart, right? Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 23. In those days, I saw Jews who married women from Ashdod, Amnon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of them and other peoples but could not speak Hebrew. Sorry, again, descriptive. I rebuked them, cursed them, beat some of their men, and pulled out their hair. All right, so, uh, again, you can't go WWE style, UFC style here, right? Uh, but what we're seeing here is, is Nehemiah. I love scripture, it's honest. Uh, he, he, he got wild, right? Because he realized the relationships are so backward, we, we, need, we, need to, we, we need to change this. I, don't beat people up and pull people's hair out, all right? But 
So verse 25, I forced them to take an oath before God and said, you must not give your daughters in marriage to their sons and take their daughters as wives for your sons or yourselves. Didn't King Solomon of Israel sin in matters like this? There was not a king like him among the nations. He who is loved by his God and God made him king over all of Israel, yet foreign women drew him into sin. Why then should you hear about doing all these terrible evil and acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Again, Nehemiah is, again, not necessarily saying, oh, this nation, this nation. No, what he's saying is people who believe in God, when you marry or date or whatever, people that are not, of, not in, in relationship with God, they will have a tendency to pull you away from the things of God. Now, what I'm not saying is this. If you're in a marriage this morning and your spouse isn't saved, Scripture is very clear in the New Testament. You, 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 you stay with them. You pray with them uh, you, you, because your words of God helps sanctify them towards coming to Christ. Does that make sense? And so, but what we're seeing here is, uh, which is really applicable for us today, is if you are single and you're dating, I want you to know this now, there's, there's secular research. I think the, the latest research I saw was that if you date somebody and they're not on the same page with you spiritually, you have an 80% chance of divorce or they lead you away. Now, I used to be a youth pastor and I'm gonna tell you, countless stories of people who dated somebody who didn't love Jesus and today, barely any of them are walking with the Lord. You want to be strong in the Lord, you're single here today, marry somebody that loves Jesus, all right? All right. So, Nehemiah, 18, uh, Nehemiah 13, verse 28, we see that the problem isn't just uh, that they were um, dating and marrying people that were not of the Lord. And his big point was this too, King Solomon, who was loved by the Lord, who built the temple originally, who did amazing things, his heart drifted away from God. Why? Because he had a thousand wives and concubines he slept with, many of whom didn't believe in God, right? That drifted his heart. I don't even, don't do the math. I don't understand that, right? It, it's, it, is, it is so mind-blowingly crazy what, what Solomon did. And it ended up dividing the kingdom and sending the kingdom to exile. The big deal here for Nehemiah is men, you're shacking up with these, with these people that don't know Christ. You're committing the same problem that sent Israel into exile. Israel was already drifting, but it got even worse. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 28. Even one of the sons of Jehoiada, son of the high priest um, Elishbib, who had become a son-in-law to Sandoval, so I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, for defiling the priesthood as well as the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Basically, this is what he's saying. These people were intermarrying of people that, were, uh, that didn't believe in God, but not only that, they were intermarrying into people that were actively opposing God, and I'm talking like the OG baddies. Uh, you have to follow me here. So you have um, uh, Jehoda, the son of Elishabib, uh, Elishabib um, the same Elishabib in the beginning, who was besties with Tobiah, the temple squatter, right? His son married the daughter of, of Sam Ballot. These are like the two big gangsters in the beginning of the book, which means there is this intermingling of ideologies and ideas and, and, and family uh, within the people of Israel, and it was making big problems. It was making big mischief. Church, we are to love the people of this world by influencing the world towards go the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we are not to love anything to do with the ideals that are opposed to God. But hear this. We often think of those who are creating mischief as, oh, those people outside the church. Oh, those atheists, right? Sometimes, they, sometimes you get a cranky atheist, right? Sometimes we get cranky atheists, put comments online, hello, right? But, but it's usually rare, right? If the atheists think that, uh, that God is the spaghetti monster, they're like, let them do whatever they want to do, right? Uh, you know, it, whatever, right? You know who causes the biggest mischief? People who say they're Christians, people who think they have a mandate by God to get people off the gospel. That's the biggest problem what we saw with Jesus. That's the biggest problem we saw in the New Testament. That's the biggest problem we deal with today. But God's truth reforms. Reforms the truth, reforms our relationships. Third thing and last thing is we're reformed by our worship. It reforms the way that we connect with God. Now, there, there, we could have a whole five-week sermon series on, on reformed of worship, how our worship is reformed in God. But there, I want to stick with the text this morning, and he deals with two things, tithing 
in attendance, all right? Now, I know that we, if you're a guest here today, you hear this each and every week, like we don't want your money, all right? Like when you say that Kenosha City Church is your local church family, uh, then we ask you to step in and, and make this happen because, it, listen, none of this happens without your generosity of bringing the first and the best, right? And so, but I want you to hear this, that if you're like a guest, like, oh man, oh, this, this isn't, don't worry about this, all right? We want you to know Jesus. We'd love to have you here at the church, all right? But the Reformation worship comes with giving. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 10. I also found out that because the portions of the Levites had not been given, each of the Levites and the singers performing the service had gone back to his own field. Therefore, I rebuked the officials, asked, why has the house of God been neglected? I gathered the Levites and the singers together and stationed them at their post. Then all of Judah brought a tenth of grain, new wine, and fresh oil into the storehouses. Basically, the people had stopped giving their tithes to the Lord's temple, and they began spending it on themselves. Uh, and this was devastating for the ministry of the Lord, and it was devastating for the brand new temple that had been refurbished. The temple began to fall in disrepair. It was during this time God sent the prophet Malachi to warn the people of God to stop robbing God and bring the full tenth of the Lord. So Malachi, chapter 3, verse 8, Malachi comes in uh, to Israel and says, hey, um, I was like, isn't that a prophet? Yeah, that's Malachi. What's Malachi going to say? And he says, thus saith the Lord. Malachi 3, 8, will you rob God? Yet you're robbing me. How do you rob? By not making the payments of the tithe and the contributions you're suffering under a curse, yet the whole nation are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I'll not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessing for you without measure. And I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that you will not ruin the produce of your land, and your vine and your field will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of armies. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate, for you'll be the delightful land, says the Lord of armies. The tithe. It means 10%. It's a standard that had been practiced before the Old Testament law, during the Old Testament law, in the days of Jesus, in the early church. We practice a tithe, except it used to be a tithe when we'd go out to eat, right? Now I think it's 22%, right? 25%. They'll do the little flip thing. I'm like, I'm just at McDonald's, 30% tip. I'm like, why is my hamburger $7 now, right? So anyway, you know what it is, the, the tip creep, right? It just, it keeps on going up, right? But the thing is, is that a percentage of giving is something that goes all the way back to antiquity. And so God says, bring a 10%. Why? Because God gives us everything. Everything is his. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And what he's saying is, I want you to bring back your first and your best and trust him with the rest. Don't bring your last and your leftovers. And, and this is really specific here. If you brought your last and your leftovers, you'd be bringing bad ears of corn. You'd be, you'd be, bringing, you'd be bringing the maligned animals. You'd be bringing uh, the worst. And God's like, no, bring the best. Bring the best to him. We're instructed... Uh, we're instructed also further in the New Testament that we are to do this with a cheerful heart. And this is where people are like, aha, I don't have a cheerful heart or God just isn't leading me, so I don't need to give. It's like, where in the world would you apply that anywhere else, right? Uh, don't lust with a cheerful heart. Don't read, you know, read the Bible with a cheerful heart, right? Uh, you know, don't, don't cuss somebody out in, 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 the, in public and do so with a cheerful heart. Well, I don't have a cheerful heart, so I'm gonna go cuss that person out. You wouldn't apply this anywhere else, but somewhere in the church, uh, it's like, well, you know, it's just how the good is my heart. Well, God, no, God has said very specifically what the starting point is, right? And we are to do that, like everything else, with a cheerful heart. Why? Because it's an act of worship. It's an act of trust, I just want to thank you all to those who are part of Kenosha City Church that make Kenosha City Church happen. Thank you to everyone uh, who makes the work of God, whether local or international, happen each and every week. But I also want to say thank you to those that are listening to the dream of what Kenosha City Church could be. Uh, you know, we're reaching teenagers every Sunday night. I want to reach hundreds of of teenagers, Pastor Brandon is doing an amazing job, reach hundreds of teenagers, not just because I have a teenager now, right? Uh, we wanna reach middle school and high school all across this area. But we wanna we want reach families, we wanna reach those that are battling addictions, we wanna help mothers uh, who have unplanned pregnancies, uh, we wanna help those with special needs, we wanna help uh, orphans all internationally, we wanna help people rescued from trafficking, but you wanna know the biggest thing is we wanna see people's souls right before the Lord God Almighty. We can do all of those things, check all those boxes, Boxes, and if we're not making sure the gospel is going out and everything that we're doing, we're doing it wrong. 
And I want you to know we're just beginning, whether it's making this place modern for decades to come, or whether it's, it's unleashing people into the mission field, whether it is uh, helping infrastructure in our youth and kids' ministries, I want you to know it's not just, it is realizing I'm giving joyfully, knowing what God can and will do. And I want you to know, in first service, in second service, I am convinced that if every single one of us stepped into the full tithe, some of us aren't giving, maybe some of you are going to step into some giving. But for those of you who are like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to step into the full tithe. I want you to know you're going to begin to see uh, Kenosha City Church go places we never have before. I'm excited about that. But notice what Malachi says. He, he says something that is only said once in all of Scripture in a positive light. It's right here. He says, test the Lord. Test the Lord. I know for some of us, this is the last area of sanctification when it comes to our finances, right? Our credit cards tell us so, right? <laughs> it's like, test the Lord. When you give God your first and your best, test him. And there's a practical way that I want you to test him. If you have not been given the full tithe or, or you haven't given it all, and again, if you're a guest, don't worry about this, right? But if you haven't because of just different fears or different things, Test him. Test him over the next 90 days. I'm not talking about health and wealth. Maybe some of you have seen these TV preachers. If you give, God's going to give you a Mercedes Benz. If you give, all your life's troubles will be done away. That is, that is, that is prosperity gospel garbage, all right? It, it's, it's wrong. It's, give, it's people giving on a false pretense. What I'm saying is this. When you trust God, whether it's with your money, whether it's with your sexuality, whether it's with your Bible reading, whether it's with your words that come out of your mouth, whatever it is, when you test God and trust God in that, he begins to reform our hearts. So over the next 90 days, and maybe you're, you're given the full time, pay attention then too, start journaling. God, today this was hard because I knew that it, I had to relinquish this. So God, today this was hard because today I'm doing, journal the next 90 days and watch what God does to your heart. I'm not, it's not naming or claiming, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, whether it's this or any other area of obedience, journal it and watch what God does in that area that's been difficult for you. Watch what God does in your heart. You wanna see him unlodge different things in your heart and replace it with trust with him. And this is where Malachi says, he says, test the Lord, watch what he does. We wanna obediently trust God with what he's entrusted us with. All right, the next thing that we see here, Reformation of worship, is setting aside time with God. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 15, at the time I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. They're also bringing in stores of grain and loading them on donkeys with wine and grapes and figs and all kinds of goods that were being brought to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what evil are you doing profaning the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same so that our God brought all this disaster on us on this city? In the Old Testament, people were supposed to uh, take part in the Sabbath day. That was to, to abstain from any work on Saturday. But there was a zeal of hard work that was happening in Jerusalem and they forgot the Sabbath day. Again, that's another uh, sin that caused them to be exiled and they're doing it again. Today, we don't have a Sabbath day on Saturday, but we do take part on Sunday in making sure that we come together in person. I can't, again, I can't count more than uh, people than one hand. I, can have, I just need one hand to count people that I said, you know what? I'm not gonna go to church anymore and I'm gonna grow. I actually, I, I don't know if I can think of anybody. All right, I know there's extenuating circumstances, there's work, there's different things like that, but when people make a choice of I'm not gonna gather together with God's people, it is detrimental to your growth in Christ. It is so important that we set aside time to be with God's people on Sunday morning. Uh, another practical way too is to go even deeper and to be in community with God's people. And if you haven't signed up for a city group, city groups have started right now, they just started, you can jump right in, sign up for a city group on our church app or the website. That is another way for you to uh, just set aside time with the Lord. But here's the deal. Oftentimes, people's kids' extracurricular activities or, working, or, or choosing to work extra on a Sunday morning or, or just sleeping in uh, or, or I'm just gonna watch online and not be with God's people. These are, listen, we are so glad that you're online, but if you're like, I'm just gonna always stay online and there's not like a medical reason for it, I want you to know this is your next step to come in person. But you know it usually takes people, uh, you know, sometimes they're watching us three or four times before they say yes that to come in. Some people are sooner than that. And so we think it's a great entry point for the church, but we want to see you here with God's people if you're in this location. Nehemiah wants to make sure that our worship is being reformed in truth. And he ends the book with this, the last verse of the book. He ends it the same way he starts it, with prayer. Nehemiah 13, 30, 
Remember me, my God, my favor. I think it's important this week, as we saw Nehemiah begin and end with prayer, that we, as a church, make sure that we take our, hold of our birthright. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a birthright to have bold access to Jesus Christ through prayer. We want to pray in service, but we also want to be a praying people in every day of our life. And this week, we're going to have a special emphasis on that. We're going to have a room open in our circle drive, uh, the circle drive portion of our building, Monday through Thursday from 10 to 5. We're going to have a prayer room open. We encourage you to come and pray with us on Thursday night. At, at, at Thursday night, we are going to have a prayer and worship night. We encourage you to join us with that as well. And for some of you, some of you ask, should I fast? Uh, again, fasting is usually the removal of food while you're praying. Uh, you can choose to fast if you'd like. Do a partial fast. Maybe it's removing junk food or maybe it's a digital fast. I'm not going to go online. You could do any of those if you choose to fast. But let's set apart this week, just as Nehemiah gave the example, that we are to be people of prayer. In fact, when Jesus cleansed the temple, you know what he said? He did not meant for his temple to become a den of robbers, but a house of prayer. And so in order for us to grow, we need to be people of his word. We need to be reformed in our relationships and our worship. But we need to be people of prayer. So Father, we love you and we thank you so much. We thank you so much for who you are and what you're going to do through us. Father, I pray for anybody in this room right now that doesn't know you as Savior. Lord Jesus, I pray that this morning they get right with you. In fact, as we continue to pray, I want to talk to anybody in this room right now. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you can know him as Savior right now. He, he, you might think, there's no way God can accept me, uh, my past or my present. Listen, he knows your past, he knows your present, and he knows your future. And he came to this world to save you from your sins. He loves you that much. If today you're uncertain you have a relationship with Jesus, or you know you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, today would you place your faith in him? You can make sure of it today. He's done all the work for you. You just need to receive it. He died on the cross to save you from your sins. Because he's a perfect sacrifice, he rose from the dead. And he's offering you now that forgiveness. That forgiveness, no matter your past, no matter your present. You just need to receive. You need to receive, placing your full faith and trust in him alone and get ready to grow. With every head's bowed and eyes closed, if that's you this morning, and this morning you're like, you know what? I need a relationship with Jesus or I need to make sure of it. Do not leave this room without making sure of it and being fully confident. But if that's you, if you know that you need a relationship with Jesus or you want to make certain of it, will you just make eye contact with me this morning? I want to, I, I want to pray for you throughout this week. Just make eye contact with me right now. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? For those of you that made eye contact, making eye contact with me doesn't save you. You're just indicating that you want to be made right with God. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. This prayer helps you communicate to Jesus what he's done for you and helping you receive what he's done for you, all right? Will you pray with me? Pray with me out loud or in, or in your mind. Just pray with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for making me. Thank you I'm not a mistake. Thank you for dying on the cross, saving me from my sins. Thank you for raising from the dead. Thank you that I can be forgiven in you. And I am now placing my full faith and trust in you alone. Help me grow now. In Jesus' name, amen. As a church, it is our honor to be a small part in all that God is doing in and through your life. And we would love to continue with you on that journey. If you became a Christian today, your next step is baptism. Baptism is when you go public with your faith in Jesus as a symbol of going from an old life into a new one. If you would like to find out more about baptism, all you have to do is go to kenosha.church events. Beyond that, if you want to know more about your next steps as a new Christian, all you have to do is go to kenosha.church slash next steps.